building an a, a, a way to monitor the integrity of the plan. One of the things I have to do is I have to, I have to identify the key steps or components to the intervention selected. So if I were going to see that the person was doing this, what would this look like? All right. So what might be, the, since we talked about check-in, check-out, what might be some of the things that you'd want to look at on a check-in, check-out system to see whether or not it's being developed and implemented correctly? What are the steps to a check-in, check-out system? Everybody here built one at some time or another or used one at one time or another? Most of you have, but a couple of you are shaking your head no. Okay. What do I have? What's the first thing I have to do? Okay. Got to build a form. What's that form got on it? Some points. All right. So there's going to be some points over here somewhere, some way to, some way to, a metric over here to say, are they doing okay? All right. So it could be smiley faces, a straight line face, a sad face. It could be numbers, but something over here that's going to give me a, a ranking. All right. What am I ranking? Expected behaviors, all right? So I'm going to have to identify what are those expected behaviors clear enough that it's pretty objective as to whether the person did it or not. All right? That's another place that these tend to get into trouble is, is, is this clear, all right? So was respectful. What the hell does that mean? And on what day of the week, all right? If today I'm a little bit tired, I expect a whole lot more respect than if I'm feeling pretty good. All right? So do I know what I'm actually marking and checking on in terms of what's happening? Is it clear enough that the student understands it? I understand it. I'm being, and if I had two people in the room, I would get a relatively close statement. One of the other things that oftentimes happens in this system may be the fact that if I come in and I'm really good, and I go to hell in a handbasket, and by the end of the period, I'm nasty, I get a lower rating than if I came in nasty and got good. Okay, even though it may be the exact amount of work in both cases. Okay, if somehow that's important to you, you probably want to indicate that somehow. All right, was there improvement? You know, you might just be a check thing. Um, but it should get the same rating as far as how much time I was on task, because we want these to be somewhat accurate. How many behaviors do you usually want to have in a check-in, check-out sheet? Two or three. Yeah, I would never go more than two or three. All right? One is for simplicity. One is the fact that if you want the kid to actually keep track of it and the teacher to keep track of it, they're not going to keep track of more than a couple of behaviors. All right? So do I have things explicit? Do I have a metric that people understand? All right? So that's, a, that's an important piece of this. Is, the, is it developed? Did somebody teach the students and the teachers how to work it? All right? What, what happens in the, in, in the beginning of the day, theoretically, in a check-in, check-out system? All right. Is there some place and somebody and the system that works as far as check-in? So is there a designated person? Do we have a designated place? All right. How many check-in, check-outs have you had that there wasn't? All right. Or maybe there is. Okay. So I'd want to look and say that. What should that person be doing? Right. Does the demeanor make any difference? Yeah. What would we like them to look like? <coughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Is this basically setting this kid up to do well? So is the is the attitude of the person is what they're talking about saying we're setting goals for the day, whatever's going on. Was the check-in actually doing what the check-in is supposed to do? All right. So I've got a thing on the form, and maybe I've got a couple of little bullet points under there in terms of are they operationally defined, do we have a good point metric, do people understand it, was this taught, all right, then was there a check-in, yes. Person have a positive attitude, do we help set goals, okay. What happens next in the check-in, check-out? What do they do as they go through the day? All right, somehow there's got to be this teacher piece, okay. So are the teachers giving feedback? And it depends on how you've got it set up. Does the student, maybe it's optional that the student goes up and gets that we'd like it, but we're not making it happen. But is it set up? Is there, is there is a system of incentives to help the student get up there, whatever's going on? Are they getting the feedback every time? And we're going to check that. And then you've got the same kind of process with the checkout. Some people may have a parent piece to it where they take it home, get a parent signature. Probably not so much at high school. 
um, but definitely usually in the, in the elementary levels is that piece in place right can you necessarily control that no but if you send it home and we know that's a problem then we know at least in the integrity of the plan that was a piece that's not there all right so it's not being carried out the way it should be but you've done your side all right so you've got basically just a quick check, check sheet maybe I go in once a month and just follow this kid you know, through a couple of sections of this. Today I'm checking, looking at the check-in. I'm going to watch and see how she does the check-in, and I'm going to fill out that component of it. Maybe some other time I'm going to watch a couple of the teachers at the end of the class period. This might go if the person's got a paraprofessional, the paraprofessional may take it and do some checking once, once or maybe once every two weeks. Is this happening? All right. Whatever the system might be, now I've got a good monitoring sheet for yes, the, impl the, the implementation seems like it took place. That makes sense. Um. <laughs> I've worked with a lot of interventions that we've called check-in, check-out, but after thinking about it in this more full explanation, I think we're calling it check-in, check-out. <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> it's probably called a check-in, check-out like system. Okay, um, that's one of the that's one of the big that's one of the issues of of looking at the integrity of what's going on. Is that an awful lot of what we do? It'll be like like I always say when I when I come to in services and things like this is the fact that even right now every one of you heard the very same words I spoke, right? Or at least got the information in some system. If I brought you back in two weeks and said, tell me about check-in, check-out, most of you would not sound like you sat in the same room at all. Okay? Because everybody hears what I'm saying and they connect it to what they already know, do, or feel, and that begins to say what I said. And it may have nothing to do with what I said. And so then people leave and they go, oh, I got this check-in, check-out stuff down now. And they go out and they implement it, and it may not meet you know, the, the criteria of the research. And that's one of those issues in terms of, of um, implementation integrity. Is, and and one, of the, one of the things in terms of, of research that's being done is we're beginning to now say, how much can we screw these things up? And they still work. All right? So we know it works if you do all of these things. Now, let's take the checkout out of it and see if that makes any difference. Let's say we're only going to get a third of the teachers to respond. Does that still work? Is that enough feedback? What if we have parents, don't have parents? And so we're starting to get dismantling research to say how much can you play with an intervention and still have it be effective? We're way away from that yet at this point in terms of being able to talk about it. But that's probably closer to what most of us do is we go in and we implement what we think is what somebody told us about or as much as we can without shaking the trees too much to get in trouble. Uh, the problem is, is that in some cases what we're doing is a lot of work for nothing because we've taken too many pieces out and it's not going to be effective. Uh, and the problem with doing that is that if you've got a teacher and you're saying make mark this, do this kind of stuff, and he or she is being very religious about doing it, and we see absolutely no change in the kid's behavior, how much credibility does that give you as an interventionist? The next time you're saying, now here's what I want you to do, they're going to go, yeah, right, I, this is like that check-in, check-out shit, isn't it? Yeah, this doesn't work, <laughs> all right? You guys don't know what the hell you're talking about. And you start losing faith in that the interventions work. So you've got to be somewhat cautious, and that's one of the other reasons that it's important sometimes to say, are we doing this with integrity? Okay. You've also got the problem that as soon as you go in, what's the teacher going to start doing? They're going to start, yeah. But you will know, that, I mean, unless you're kind of brain dead, you will typically notice by watching the kids that this is something this teacher is not doing all the time, right? Usually you watch the kids, they're going, right? Because this is new, all right? And that happens. And what you just talk about, and part of the issue, I think, is, is getting a thick enough skin to just be able to talk about it. And say, this is, I know this is a pain. Here's why we're doing it. But you know what? One of the things I don't really believe this is happening, and I don't believe it's happening because of the, re the reaction I got when you started doing it. And, you're, you know, you're not their boss. You're just, you know, but this isn't going to work if we don't do it. And again, if you can shift it to academics, 
most teachers get it. If I say, would you teach punctuation this way? Would you teach math facts? Would you teach, you know, American history? With as little feedback as you want this kid to change their behavior with. No, it's not going to happen if you give them that little feedback. It also is important to, to let them know this is a feedback tool, not a responsibility tool. Because especially as you get in the middle school and high school, this responsibility thing just becomes an overwhelming issue for teachers. You know, and it's like, no, that's not what we're teaching with this. That's a whole nother issue. All right. All right. Um, so who will collect the data? When will the data be collected? How are these going to be analyzed? And then how will we receive, receive feedback? Those questions need to be answered. I don't know how many schools I'll go in and they've collected the data. Nobody's looked at it. It's like we've spent all this time. We've got, I was actually in a school in Omaha. They had a, they, we were looking at suspensions. They were doing a, a, a bunch of stuff. They had one little girl who'd been suspended. She wasn't a special, uh, special needs child, but she'd been suspended for over 35 days. Nobody even recognized that. It's like, I don't care who you get. You take your best student, send them home 35 days of the school year, they aren't going to do well. <laughs> right? And clearly, suspension wasn't working. Right? If I'm on my 35th day, it ain't happening. Right? This is not an effective strategy. But nobody was keeping track of that because she wasn't special needs. All right? If she'd been special needs, I'd have had it monitored because of the 10-day thing. Right? But she wasn't, so she could get 35. So let's say I want to look at increasing praise or reprimand. And we've talked about this before. For a lot of our students, this is an incredibly powerful metric. Most students who get more reprimand than praise will not do well in that class. Right? We've in fact done a number of studies where we found if we can't shift teachers' praise to reprimand ratio, other interventions become less effective that almost becomes a gatekeeping situation. If, I, if all of a sudden I'm hearing, you know, don't stop it, and most of you know you can go into a certain classroom and certain kids' names mean stop it, right? And the teacher says, Randy, you know it's not because you want Randy to do something, she wants Randy to stop doing something, right? And you might hear this a hundred times in the course of a, of, a, of a period, this is not a kid who's probably gonna do particularly well. So, that made, so we, we look at that a lot in, in, in classrooms that I'm in, and we want to talk about, well, all right, then what is, what do we mean by a verbal praise for academics? What do we mean by a verbal praise for behavior? Reprimand, correction. Okay. I know we've talked about this before, but <laughs> do you have like a nice little concise sheet of paper that lists the research behind why praise is better than punishment? So for those teachers who really strongly still do not believe the fact that you tell them that praise is more powerful than punishment, that they can like read this academic sheet and understand it that way? Uh, yeah, in fact, we're going to get to some sites, and I'll, 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 I'll point a couple of sites <laughs> that actually talk about that kind of thing. You know, th this is one of those bizarre issues. It's probably one of the, do you think there's really any teacher out there that hasn't at least heard in a class that praise is more important than punishment? It is probably one of the most simple, easy kind of issues as far as, is it important to praise kids? Yes. I'll tell you the dilemma that I hit is that most teachers are completely unaware of their level of praise to reprimand. And I'll go in and I'll say, do you think you praise more or reprimand more? I have not yet had a teacher who said, oh hell, I reprimand more. <laughs> right? Every teacher says, oh, I praise a lot more. All right? Well, not really. Okay. Your reprimand is six times more likely than your praise statements. What? They have no awareness of that. Right. And part of it's because the reprimands just roll off our tongues. Praise is usually something we have to be conscious about doing. And so we, we're aware of when we're, when, we're, when we're praising. We're not always aware of when we're reprimanding. Right. So it can be a real powerful tool just even that. Now, and one of the things that I find interesting, when I go into schools, I have this little thing that I oftentimes do and I'll, I'll give teachers feedback on stuff. Now again, I'm not anybody, right? I mean, I'm not their boss. I'm nobody else. You know, it's kind of a lot of times they can say thank you for don't let the door hit you and a button the way out. You know, it's just, I'm just there for feedback, right? But when I come back, oftentimes I say, can you do that again? They really want to know how I'm doing. I really tried to work on this. 
You know, and if we can get stuff set up to where people can be getting feedback without feeling like they're going to be beaten up by it, most teachers want the feedback if it can be done in an effective way. Right. So, one, do we have a definition of what's going on? Right. So any comment, noise, gesture, action by the teacher to indicate that a behavior displayed by the student was undesired. So if I say, I'm a teacher and I just kind of go, that's a reprimand. All right. Huh? <laughs> okay. So what's the, because it's a message of what I'm doing is wrong. And what I want to look at is what's my ratio of messages that what we're doing here is good versus what we're doing here isn't so good. How many of you would like to come in day in and day out to a program where the people in charge told you that basically what you do here, you don't do well? Okay. Many of our students, that is exactly what they hear every day when they come to school. Whatever we do here, you don't do it well. But hey, come back tomorrow enthusiastic, won't you? <laughs> so I can tell you again tomorrow that you aren't doing it well. So, and you've seen this before, we've done this kind of thing before, but I might look at this kind of situation and say, okay, and it's, you know, just basically a quick graph. Again, a para can do this, a related service person can come in, I can come in for 15 minutes in an in a exchange kind of situation and take data on this and have a sense of what's the, what's the ratio of praise to reprimand. In fact, I generally tell people don't even think about taking data for more than 20 minutes at a time because your brain goes on vacation after about 20 minutes and you're not nearly as reliable of a coder as you are in that first 20 minutes. So go in, take 15 minutes of data once a week, once every two weeks. I want to look and see what's going on. All right? and it would simply be a matter of checking each one of those kind of situations going on. And, and you might have some comments. All right? One of the things that you may oftentimes see is that teachers praise academics and we reprimand behavior. And so I might have a nice ratio but all of my praise is going to academics, and all of my reprimand is going to behavior. All right? Well, that's not going to be as desirable as if I can get some of that praise over to that behavior. Yeah, somewhere down there. <laughs> when you're collecting data like this, um, I'd be concerned about the integrity of observation data when you're coming in. The teacher knows that that's what you're observing, and they start to perform, mm -hmm. um, and then you. And a couple hours later, you get the kids coming in and saying, when you came in and observed today, so-and-so was, was putting on a act. That's not how they are every day. So how do you make sure that this data has integrity if the teacher knows you're looking for the positives? Oh, they will. Yeah, yeah everybody does. Everybody does. And it could be, be better or for worse. Yeah, I mean, it, and I'll, I'll tell you, a, a part of the issue for me, and... I don't really care because a couple of things happen. Oftentimes when I go in, I know the teacher's doing this differently than, than he or she would be doing normally. One of the things that oftentimes happens though is that the kids respond differently. And the teacher all of a sudden begins to see that, you know, here's this kid who had his head down the whole time, never does squat. All of a sudden we start praising, paying attention to what's going on. We're calling on him because this may be a couple things that I'm looking at. All right. Are you giving him opportunities to respond? Are you praising his correct responses? When he complies, do you pay attention to his compliance? All of a sudden, this kid's behaving differently. Now my issue can be, wow, when I give, when I, because I also have to give feedback. I was really impressed with how Randy did when you were paying attention to that. And I'll point it out. Now the teacher may have, <laughs> like, I've never done it before, but you're right. Okay. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Um, and that's okay, it's a teaching moment, all right? Um, I might also, if it gets, and sometimes you'll get where the kids start misbehaving. And then you can talk about the fact that your attention's powerful. The minute you started shifting your attention, kids started behaving differently because they want you to attend. Okay? So you're a powerful tool here. Now what we gotta do is, let, is get you using yourself strategically. A lot of teachers don't realize when I get the R sometimes. So even looking in there, you're going to see the ones that are constantly <coughs> doing them, you know, not, not crazy. That, that's going to come out whether they change the behavior for you or not. I, I stop at almost any. I should be repeating what they're saying, shouldn't I? Are you hearing this or do I need to repeat it? Repeat it. Okay, I, I got to. 
get this down. So what she was saying is that some teachers, um, well, go ahead and say it again. So. I was saying that some teachers are so negative anyway, they don't, even, they don't think it's a problem, they're not aware of it, so you'll still see it when you're observing, right. even, if some of, even if they're trying harder or whatever, because you're there, they're not seeing that as a problem. Right. Yeah, so teachers don't notice that they're being negative. And I, and I think, again, one of the things for me when I go in and observe, and I do this a lot in classrooms, is I don't think anybody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to do a shitty job today. Okay? Everybody comes in and does the absolute best job they can. And I think that, uh, that one of the things is that teaching is just so private. And that oftentimes that they, they don't get any feedback. And, and feedback's different than evaluation. When the principal comes in, that's evaluation. I'm talking feedback. They don't have to listen to it. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted, my thing was falling apart. Um, so, you know, it, it, this, is just, this is just feedback on how you're doing. There's not a value aspect to this, all right? It's not gonna have any, any impact on what's going on. I will have principals sometimes will say, tell me what you saw. And I always say, no, that's your job, all right? I don't, you know, I'll tell the teacher. If the teacher wants to share it with you, great. But this is between me and the teacher. I pretty much see this only working with like an outside person doing it. I know like we struggle as a team. We have paraprofessional written down there. I'm like laughing. There's no way in hell our teachers would let a paraprofessional sit and take data on their academic and behavior praise. And then I think, okay, we'll get one of the behavior team people to come in. <laughs> nope, we're not welcome either. You know? <laughs> and then who do we have left? Our supervisor. Well, then it becomes evaluative. And if she knows the information, it's going to be on their summative. Or, you know? um, and I guess. You know, that's obviously a team issue, trying to get people's comfort levels there. And again, I think you need to see some, here's the positive of us doing this for them to want us to continue to come in and do it. But we have not been able to figure out how to break past that. So, so the issue is, is who to collect. And, and, and the comment being that teachers won't be comfortable with a para doing it. They won't be comfortable with a behavior specialist doing it. If we call a supervisor in, now it's an evaluation. Uh, if it's a principal or a, you know other, I'll tell you that in most schools that I work with, it's a paraprofessional. And in some cases, it's just a matter of I don't care that you like it or don't like it. This is the person who can do it. We're we're collecting data. We're collecting data. And and that that, that that's part of sometimes that sharp stick thing, of saying that as a school we have to have data on implementation. Now I'll tell you another horror story. I was just in a due process hearing in, in Indianapolis, no Fort Wayne, Indiana. The school got lost a portion of the due process hearing because they could not prove they had implemented all of the accommodations every day. They did not have data to support their implementation of the accommodations. I've never heard of that before. I'm thinking, holy crap. If we have to start proving that we're doing, and, and I don't know what, what your IEPs look like. I've been in, in places where the IEP, is, it's, a, it's a 23 check thing on, on accommodations and every one of them's checked. Right? And it's like, all right, now prove you're doing all those. All right? They lost the due process on that. All right? A, because they couldn't, they didn't have data to support that they were doing it. <laughs> and then at this point, because the, the state board supported it, they're the ones that said, yep. But I thought it would only be that was the way the IEP was written. If you're able to show that they made the benchmarks and you're able to show that they. It's their right to have the accommodations. So I could be making progress if the parents are saying you're not following the IEP. I'm doing the work because I'm working with my kid at home. They don't have to prove they're not doing it. You have to prove you are. Absolutely not. It's you have to demonstrate that you have implemented the IEP the way it's supposed to be. Now, I've never heard that before. I'm hoping Illinois doesn't do anything. I'm hoping it was a mistake on the part of Indiana State Board. It is a, I couldn't imagine that level. But I'll tell you one of the things that I'm telling every school is accommodations are to give an even playing field. Not wouldn't it be nice if the kid had this. And we should not be checking 30 things that we're doing. There should be very clear this kid needs this accommodation to have a level playing field with the other kids. Okay. And nothing else. Okay, so we minimize those to what we give them what they need but not what would just be nice. 
There isn't a number. It's because it depends on the kid. So if you have a really needy kid and they really need some accommodation some days, but they have this long list of them. Yeah, then, then you get into the problem of, and, 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 uh, of when you put as needed. Okay. When needed, you need to tell when, when they need it. And schools have gotten in trouble and they said when needed because, again, I'll bring in everybody and say, when, do you, when did Billy need this? How do you know when Billy needs this? Thank you. How do you know when Billy needs this? If I'm making the right. The other problem is schools have gotten in trouble if they say when the student asks for it. All right, which is bizarre because we're trying to teach self-advocacy in some cases. That should be something that we're building on. And I don't know if a school made a good argument that they're trying to teach self-advocacy, they've got a good thing in their plan where they're actually truly directly instructing that and made that as part of the issue, they might sustain that. But usually schools get in trouble if they say they leave it to the student, especially at the high school level because dignity-wise, kids won't ask for anything. So if you've got a good, if it should be spelled out, if you've done a good job and you've identified what the student needs as far as supports based upon, a, especially on a behavioral kind of thing and it's built into your intervention plan, it should be pretty clear and you should be able to defend what's going on and you shouldn't have to necessarily identify when it's needed. And that's true. If you've got a, you know, if you've got a good plan, it should be there. What do you do if the student refuses to go to the altered location and have the test read? Because of the Did you offer it? So if, so if, the, if the student refuses it, Again, it's sort of like you can, you know, I, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him fish, right? Kind of a thing. Um, sort of Johnny Carson. So the, the part, part of the issue is that, did you in fact offer? Was it clear? All right. The student, and I, that, then I would probably want to know that. If I offered an accommodation, the student refused it. I might on the back of the quiz or whatever's going on saying, accommodation was offered, student refused. All right. So if there's any question about this, you can say, and I might talk with the parents or whoever at some point to say this is a, and, and, and I understand why it's a problem. The other thing is that I have to think about why might a student refuse it? When it goes part of the other thing of monitoring this, let's say that I know this kid really does need extra time in a quiet place. Right? But as soon as I give out the papers and I go, um, would you like to go in the other room? <laughs> okay. Uh, and lo and behold, I'm offering it, but the kid's not taking it. All right. What might you find as you began to look at that implementation of that plan? What might be a problem here? Yeah, we're not protecting the child's dignity in terms of how we're implementing that particular accommodation. So maybe the plan has to be altered. Because we just didn't think about that. All right. um, some of the ones that, that where, where we, where, and it comes to like some of the medical issues, we'll get a lot of kids, especially if I've got a kid with ADHD, and, I, and, they, and they've got a history of having been punished for their behaviors tied to their attention deficit disorder. You will also oftentimes get a secondary comorbid disorder of oppositional defiant disorder. There's actually been some good research showing that we are part of developing that secondary disability by punishing them for behavior they don't have total control over. All right? Now I've got a kid who's oppositional, def oppositional defiant. Does how a staff member approach that kid critical to how that student's going to respond? So that becomes part of the intervention plan. How do they have to implement this? If I, you know, I'm not giving you a free pass. If you do something wrong, I'm still going to call you on your behavior. You're I'm doing something wrong. Oh, falling apart. All the way Sorry. Okay, now you can hear me again. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. It's supposed to go on. All right. Um, so the issue becomes: I may have a thing about what was, you know, what was the tone of voice being used. How was this person approached? There's the 1045. <laughs> so they don't know how to turn off my phone. This smart, this got a new phone that's smarter than I am. Okay. All right, we're gonna take a break. We'll come back. So see you at 11 o'clock. Bathrooms, for those of you who don't know, are just down the hall here to the right.